good effect of Trump could be revealing the negative, the, the, the problems within the system, because there are problems within the system, and this is what's good about it. However, if he would win the second mandate, for me, it looks like this would be a disaster. So this would be going really too much over the line with this American nationalism, America first. It's really a kind of nationalism that we are witnessing now. Destruction of all multilateral organizations. He started successfully with World Health Organization, went further on. So he is dismantling the mechanisms that should be helping us tomorrow in some kind of ecological crisis. He even, I think, dismantled the Center for the Control of epidem uh, epide uh, Epidemiological Diseases, something like yeah. this. And yeah. this is really a funny that he now talks about all these. All these people. I'm so sorry for interrupting you. I just I, I can't resist mentioning. The, there's a bunch of there's a scientific community at MIT that was prior to the pandemic studying with Wuhan scientists in caves, precisely to prepare for the for the mental possibility that just maybe perhaps because of the systemic risk of the air, airline industry, how it's flying and interconnected, maybe it will emerge from caves in Wuhan. And their funding was their funding was terminated by by these people. Yeah, no, this is and he, uh, if he goes on like this, uh, yes, he pointed out the problems, but now he would really make it even worse. Would you agree? Would you disagree? Would you? You know, I I, I know you. I understand what you're saying, and uh, we have to be kind of realistic. And some would some people would say cynical enough to accept that. Uh, 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 revelations come from the worst possible sources, and that and that some uh, uh, you know catastrophic outcome has to happen before people come to their senses regarding what what exactly is dysfunctional. But at the same time, I do think there is a kind of dangerous tendency to uh, equate you know disillusionment with the Democratic Party establishment and the liberal left wing with apologetics for Trump. And I think that's a serious mistake. In other words, I think some some of us in this uh, whatever we are kind of left lefty you know uh, uh, people who uh, right that uh, we are so bitter about and we are especially bitter with liberal intellectuals who can't seem to understand what a disaster the Democratic Party has become for decades, and we grasp at straws from Trump in an effort to show like oh look even tr and then we all go a little too far in that direction. So. Uh, Look, there's a bunch of different narratives on the on the kind of uh, electoral marketplace. They they are not as diverse as like them, and the ones that seem to triumph over over the others are not necessarily the ones we would like, and um, uh, they are not adequately represented in the electoral process. But there are narratives that exactly convey the kinds of things you're mentioning about. I mean, Elizabeth Warren was very very aggressive, and her, throughout her career in uh, emphasizing the corporate, I'm sorry, did it, I broke off for a moment. Mm -hmm. uh, I was just mentioning how uh, there were a number of currents in this electoral cycle of the primaries on the Democratic side, including from so-called moderate candidates, even more so from the Bernie, Elizabeth Warren, uh, uh, you know, uh, Tulsi Gabbard, you know, uh, uh, those, I mean, those would have been inconceivable in 2004, 5, 6. And now they are closer and closer to the uh, kind of what's what's central is the Democratic Party. They don't win out, but uh, they are there. And Biden, to a large extent, has been tilted towards a, a an agenda that is much more progressive than the, I mean, if you compare Biden's policy platform, forgetting for a moment whether he will fulfill anything he's saying yeah. about undocumented, forgetting for a moment, but just considering the platform. The fact that this platform is significantly more uh, uh, assertive in questions of immigration, in questions of economic uh, justice, in questions of racial justice, than Hillary's platform four years ago is already a sign of the uh, as a sign of success in my view. Leaving aside what what will be implemented, probably very little, but the mere fact that he has felt the need to signal to uh, 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 people in this regard is already is already a sign of how it's not just uh, uh, the revolt against the establishment and the revolt against globalization on the on the right wing Trumpian version of things. So that's one thing. Another thing is 
when we talk about this uh, revolt against the establishment, I don't necessarily think it's it's as new as 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 this as this particular episode. I think if you go back to the 90s and ask people, you know, there were all kinds of failed attempts to uh, uh, convert. You know, if you look at public opinion, it turns out that Democrats and Republicans agree on a whole lot of stuff, ranging from environmental uh, conditions, clean water, clean air, to they may disagree about the me mechanisms to get there, but ranging from things like that to corporate corruption and resentment towards you know, big conglomerates who are, who are doing some sinister thing. Uh, 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 ideas of, you know, there's a, there's a list of things, including healthcare in the 1990s. You ask people, would you prefer some kind of Canadian style system, single payer? A majority said yes, consistently in the 90s, let alone, let alone in this debate where before Tea Party and Obamacare and all the rest of it, right? So there was a basis and people like, you know, Ron, Ron Paul, if you're aware of him in the American system, and Ralph Nader, if you're aware of him, would get together and say, you know, forget the kind of uh, Democratic-Republican uh, divide, which they would refer to as the uh, uh, two cheeks of the same ass. And then they tended to point out that, yeah, all this, all this consensus exists across the political divide, but the problem is often mobilizing people. It's, it's not enough to just have the public opinion if it doesn't get transferred into. So it's a, it's a sociological story in the sense that it's not about, you know, people transferring their beliefs and values consistently into the political arena. They just have those political beliefs and they don't get transferred in any way. They don't show up to the city council meeting. They don't vote. I mentioned how little young people vote, right? Uh, uh, the mobilizing, organizing is much more important than the actual, you know, uh, 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 widespread democratic consensus. And who, who, who wins in the mobilizing, organizing? That's really the question. There's but a literature, for example, I'm sorry, I, I'm talking too much, but there's a literature in the, uh, in, in, uh, there's a whole literature by professors at Harvard about how over the past 20, 30 years, uh, a network of uh, right-wing donors, such as the Koch brothers. I don't know if you're aware of it. Like, if you look just at the Koch brothers and what they have been able to achieve in terms of creating and funding institutes and conferences and think tanks and, uh, and pumping out publications and memos and policy briefs that through, through a lot of money and through painstaking, stubborn, you know, uh, uh, mobilizing, organizing with committees and with staff and funding these staff and opening up offices and giving them polite names, such as, you know, Friends of American Liberty or whatever it may be, you know, one of these Orwellian names. <laughs> and they, lo and behold, over 20 years, they develop a kind of infrastructure of uh, uh, very influential uh, 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 ideological centers that are tilting the political agenda for the whole country, even though they may represent, you know, 7% of the electorate or something like that. So a lot of the American democratic outcomes is about organizational capacity, less so than, than you know, what are the Americans thinking? I mean, that, that's... But if, if I may just uh, to follow up on this uh, and, and say something that seems to me to be a big problem and a significant democratic deficit, not just in the States, but, but elsewhere as well, is how do you uh, make real issues relevant within a broader public discourse? How do you uh, make uh, uh, narratives that would reflect very complex problems uh, be discussed and actually be the platform for some kind of uh, more concrete political uh, initiative. Because what I see as a big problem is, and, and what Danilo was just uh, explaining actually illustrates that very well, uh, you need to work hard even if you have a pretty simplistic uh, message with a very clear interest behind it to actually make that uh, something that becomes a predominant ideological narrative and a platform for formulating certain policies. And of course, they reflect uh, concrete interests. But uh, my, my uh, question is uh, the, the challenge for, let's say, the left. And the reason I think uh, is not just that people 
on the left are very often um, incompetent and uh, the way they phrase things is stupid and all of that, which also uh, may very often be the case. But the more general uh, uh, systemic problem is that uh, the level of complexity of contemporary societies has gotten to such, a, uh, such an extent that it becomes very difficult to put in simple phrases that uh, people would, uh, you know, support and would vote for, uh, and that to to make that actually account for anything. So there is a pressure uh, coming from the right, which uh, which is there in a big advantage because it is, uh, as as the Nimble said earlier, it is much easier to say, yeah, we are we are under the attack of uh, whoever happens to be uh, Muslims, Mexicans, Russians, or somebody else. Uh, and but then uh, the logic of the public space, the way it has evolved, especially with social media and, and everything else, uh, has been that, that then we are uh, compelled, or anybody who happens to be trying to counterfeit those narratives, to actually come up with very simplistic ideas and binary set of concepts as a platform to counterfeit the first one. And I think that's a real problem because I don't think that actually can be done in a successful way because then we are trapped into the same ideological uh, uh, trap uh, and we are not escaping it if we play this game of, you know, it, it is uh, this or that, it is uh, uh, red or blue or, or black and white because the level of, of, of problems is so great that it, it becomes uh, uh, even difficult to think how could you possibly translate that into a meaningful political political program. Let's say just like it's it's a, we've been discussing, you know, is it Biden and what 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 are the points in Biden's program? But like how any of these with Biden or with somebody else, uh, what would a program look like that would really have a potential to transform, let's say, American society? You know, a program that would propose some meaningful and realistic solutions for uh, dismantling corporate power, for fixing the broken political system, for uh, developing new jobs, for, uh, you know, doing something meaningful about ecological crisis, uh, to do something about, uh, you know, healthcare system and, and the deadlock, uh, uh, the, uh, how to do that in, a, in, in, in the world which uh, works a, as it does, and how actually then package that message through the media that are also owned by the very same corporations very often, uh, in order to actually stimulate people to say, okay, this is realistic and this sounds sexy enough that I'll vote for it. Uh, that seems to be, uh, to me, a real question that that uh, we might uh, think about maybe some other time. Oh, you know, is that all? <laughs> <laughs> just, just that? 